What's up everybody, my name is Cody and today we are going to talk about why is multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder not real. But before I get into the full story, the main story today, I want to share with you three important names first. Number one, Chris Sizemore, aka Eve. Eve was the first publicly recorded case of multiple personality disorder. The case happened in early 1950s and Eve has about three different personalities, namely Eve Black, Eve White, and Jane. Yeah, I was suspecting Eve Brown or Eve Grey, but Jane, yeah. It was later on published into a movie as well, known as Three Faces of Eve. After looking at the, the clip of Eve, turning from one altar to, to the other, I realized there were a couple of interesting things. Number one, in order to reach Jane, you must go through Eve Black first, then transfer to Eve White, then only you can go to Jane. You cannot go from Eve Black to Jane straight away. Don't know why. Number two, Eve didn't seem to lose her memory. Because most of the other patients usually when they switch from one personality to the other personality, they don't have the memory of the first personality. But Eve seems to be able to record just about everything. Uh, so if it was like kind of like a mood swing uh, instead of uh, you know uh, totally different persons living in a single body, watching the entire full video of um, Eve turning from one personality to the other personality, I, I felt like the doctor that was talking to Eve in the video was kind of like setting up a stage for Eve to prove to the entire world that she in fact has multiple personalities. There was this part of the video where the doctor asked different Eve to pick different clothes and tell her emotions about those clothes. So it felt kind of like a showcase, like, oh, so this is a, if black, if black will pick these clothes and you know, I'll feel this way and if white will do otherwise. So I don't know, I, I wasn't really convinced about, about the entire if thing. The second person I want to introduce is also our main character of this video, Shirley Mason, also known as Sybil. That's right, Sybil is like, a, like an American household name back in 19, 50s. Um, her case was diagnosed in, in 1954 and it was later published into a book. The reason she was known as Sybil is because the name of the book is Sybil. Also published into a TV film as well. For the rest of this video, we'll just call her Sybil. And third is of course this guy known as Billy Milligan. Now Eve has three personalities and it happened in early 1950s. Sybil has 16 personalities and it happened in 1954. Billy Milligan has 24 personalities and it happened in around 1977. If you haven't seen the full uh, video of Billy Milligan, I made a video about that, go ahead and check it out. It was also kind of published into a movie as well afterwards, known as Split. It's not entirely based on that story, but it was kind of inspired by Billy Milligan. So these are the, like, the famous cases of multiple personality disorder patients in the United States. Uh, in the earlier time. As I mentioned, we focus on Sybil for this video. Why? Because Sybil has been debunked. Debunked by who? I'm gonna give you the full story timeline right now. It happened when Sybil first met a doctor named Dr. Wilbur. Dr. Wilbur diagnosed Sybil as multiple personality disorder patient with 16 different personalities. So for those of you who watch um, Billy Milligan's video, it's also important to know that Dr. Wilbur was also involved in Billy Milligan's treatment and was one of the main person who suggests Billy Milligan has MPD. And then, Dr. Wilbur wanted to publish the story of Sybil, but she couldn't write, so she looked for a friend, Flora Schreiber, who was a journalist, a writer, and they published the book together. But before they published the book, Flora Schreiber said to Dr. Wilbur that she will only publish a book if Sybil's personalities were all merged into one. So true enough, took Dr. Weber three years and she integrated Sybil into one whole person. And then they wrote a book together and sold more than 6 million copies. That was pretty much equivalent to um, a Bible sales in that time. So you can imagine how powerful was that. And then that's how Sybil later was turned into a TV series as well. And everybody knows about Sybil. Now what's scary about that is that everybody also thought 
that Sybil was 100% real story. The truth was that it was quite loosely based on a true story. So then Dr. Wilbur and uh, the author of the book, Sybil, they go on different kind of talk shows, TV shows, all that. Uh, you can check out. Has anybody suggested this is a hoax? He, oh, had, he needed some evidence. A uh... hoax has been breathed down our necks by various people at various stages of this project. Actually, experience. it isn't a hoax. Tragically, it isn't a hoax. It would yeah. be much better for Sybil <laughs> and possibly for all of us if it were, because this was dreadful to bear. This is true. It doesn't sound plausible. It doesn't sound possible. But true, it is. Yeah. For us, Schreiber's response when the host of the TV show suggested that this whole thing is a scam, is a hoax, she got really defensive. Fast forwarding, a lot of years later, Debbie Nathan wrote a book to debunk the entire Sybil case. And the book title is Sybil Exposed. And of course, it also becomes another bestseller. So readers are also quite curious, like why does Debbie Nathan expose the entire thing? Well, it's not like she wanted to tell the world that these people are liars, everybody deserves to know the truth. She's not on that kind of cause. The author actually wanted to demonstrate the fact that this so-called fake news, like Trump, have influenced the entire world in a destructive way. I'll tell you more about that later. Because before the book Sybil, the original Sybil book, before it was published by Flora Schreiber, which was in 1973, there were only around 100 cases in the entire United States of multiple personality disorder. It was a very rare disorder. A few years after the book was published, American Psychiatric Association recognized officially that multiple personality disorder is real. And then suddenly, thousands and thousands of people got diagnosed with that. The interesting fact is that most of them were women. Then everybody started to go on a talk show and told the story of themselves having 15 personalities, 20 personalities, 500 personalities, 1,500 personalities. The sky is the limit. So people couldn't help to think that the impact the book Sybil has on the world were they also part of the reason that American Psychiatric Association recognized the disorder? Were they also part of the reasons that thousands and thousands of women put themselves in the shoes of Sybil? And not to forget, Dr. Wilbur also opened up her own treatment center. Why was Sybil suggested as a fake case? Um, I kind of summarized there are like three important factors that people believe is fake. Number one, the use of hypnosis and hypnotic drug. So hypnosis is a powerful tool, even since way back then. So uh, even I do today, even though I hypnotize people for entertainment purpose, but hypnosis was used for therapy purpose for the longest time in the history. How does hypnosis work is that suggestions were given to the subject's subconscious or maybe directly to their conscious. Even before their first therapy began, few months back, Dr. Wilbur already met Sybil. And what she did is she passed Sybil a classic book of multiple personality disorder and suggested her to read up. So true enough, Sybil read about the book and a few months later, Sybil showed up at the door of Dr. Wilbur's clinic as Peggy. She stepped in, she said, hi, my name is Peggy, and she appeared to be a little girl. And then over the therapies, Dr. Wilbur also began to treat Sybil with a type of hypnotic drug. So apparently you take the drug and then you kind of hypnotize. It's also known as truth serum. It exists, truth serums. So it's not, it's not really something that you take and then you kind of like, oh, I'm telling you my truth right now, my ATM pin number is. Uh, it's not really that. What it does, truth serum, it kind of relaxes your body and then it allows your conscious mind to be very tired and so you can hardly think about anything. Your critical judgment become weakened and so you're all limsy and all that, you know, and then you're like, oh, what's your ADM puzzle? Oh, I'm so lazy to make up a lie. I'm not gonna tell the truth. That kind of truth serum. So apparently it was a very popular drug a lot of psychiatrists used back then because you can talk to a patient over and over and over again for a few hours until you and them are already tired and then they will tell the truth in their subconscious or you use the drug, within minutes, they already, you already can dwell into their subconscious mind and find out the truth. So Dr. Wilbur will utilize that as well, of course. Now you look at me and you begin to hit the feet. One, two, three, and you may go to sleep. Something happened last night at 10 minutes after 10. What happened? She died. Who is she? That, that other girl. 
I don't know her name. Yes, dear, you do. No, Doctor, I don't know her name. I don't see her very many times. And what did she say? She talked to me. And what did she talk about? I don't feel sick. It's all right, sweetie. What's your name? I'm Shirley. Mm-hmm. She said her name is Shirley. How old are you? Hmm? Eleven. Mm-hmm. So there are two Shirley's, the eleven-year-old Shirley and the grown-up Shirley. Right? What stopped you from growing up, sweetie? 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 So I don't know what you think about the video. Uh, what I found was that Dr. Wilbur was literally giving like suggestions, not very obvious suggestions, because suggestions are kind of instructions given in a not obvious way. So at some point she was asking Shirley, which is original name of Sybil, questions like, so there are two different Shirley's, right? It's like, I can hardly say no, because the way you ask him like, oh yeah, yeah. And considering the social compliance of Sybil or any patient, when you go and see a doctor, you would naturally want to comply to the doctor because of the power of authority and that's something very powerful. You will want to think that the doctor is right. So when the doctor says there are two Shirley's right, you naturally want to say yes. And when the doctor asks you to give a name, you naturally want to follow that. So because of the use of hypnosis and hypnotic drug and also suggestions which could cause thoughts that are not so true, people are suspecting that whatever conversations happen in the therapy sessions are not accountable. So the second factor that people are suspecting is because of Dr. Wilbur's role and underlying intention. Yes, as we talk about how she would kind of suggest Sybil has multiple personality disorder to Sybil herself, her intention for the longest time was also to look for a MPD patient herself. She has always craved for one, she has been studying about the subject most of the time, and then she found one that could fit into her case then she kind of want that to happen. She could be doing it intentionally, she could be doing it unknowingly too. So part of the therapy, Dr. Wilbur was looking for trauma. Practically, even until today, most of the psychologists in the world were practicing on theories based on Sigmund Freud, which is like the father of psychology. And Sigmund Freud suggests that if there's an effect, there's a cause. Meaning to say if your adulthood is oops, we can't say that word, is you know, um, not so proper, um, then probably has something to do with your child. You know, you fell off the bicycle, that's why you're always scared about bicycle. So, and you know, if you have, you know, split personality, probably because you had some trauma, you're being tortured when you were young or, you know, abused when you were young. But it's surprised to know that this theory of cause and effect was not always true. Because if you think about it, not everybody who had fell off from bicycle when they were young are now afraid of riding bicycles again. And not everybody who were tortured are living a miserable life right now. But nevertheless, Dr. Wilbur was certain that there was some trauma causing it. So because she was looking for it, she eventually found it in one of their conversations when Sybil was hypnotized. Dr. Wilbur later found that when Sybil was young, the sadistic mom was very much abusing her and she would do stuff like sticking stuff up her and a lot of other horrible things. The later years of their treatment, basically Dr. Wilbur also worked with the other doctor. And when Dr. Wilbur is not around, this doctor will take care of Sybil. And when Sybil came into the therapy session, Sybil will ask the question, so do you want me to be Helen today? This doctor was like, what do you mean I want you to be the Helen? I want you to be you. I don't need you to be anyone specifically. And Sybil was like, oh sure, because usually Dr. Wilbur wanted me to be Helen. So from that conversation itself, it sounded like there was a grain of truth when we say manipulations were involved in the conversation between Dr. Wilbur and Sybil. So the third factor that people were suspecting the whole Sybil case was fake was because of the writer herself, Flora Stryber. It was reportedly said that when she was approached by Dr. Wilbur, she was also working on her, you know, book of the century. So she probably won a big story as well. It's good to take note that Dr. Wilbur died at 1992 and she left Sybil 25,000 in her will. And also Sybil admitted before she died that every word published by Flora Schreiber in the book Sybil 
was true. So I'm guessing if the whole thing is really fake, if the whole thing is really fake, this could be what happened. Number one, Sybil was still lying until the very last breath of her life. Maybe she got the 25,000. Or number two, she was so into her lie that she eventually believed that it was real. Pretty much like hypnosis. Just like when I hypnotize people, I get them to imagine that they are hypnotized. And when they imagine enough, they are eventually hypnotized. If you notice, right, depression is very much related and linked to DID. DID, it's kind of the, the new term for MPD. We'll talk about that in a moment. So I've heard friend who has depression who was also diagnosed with DID. I mean, the friend's depression was kind of obvious to us, but nothing suggested that that friend ever has DID. So that's the part that I was surprised about. And then I came across this study about this girl, this lady named Janet Bartha. She claimed that she went into a session thinking that she has depression, but when she left, the doctor told her that you actually have DID. While she described her experience with the doctor, it felt like the SOP was pretty much the same. First of all, she went in, she said, doctor, I have depression. And doctor said, how do you feel? Doctor put her under drugs. And then she started saying, I'm feeling a little bit sad and all that. And doctor starting to ask her to associate these feelings to name. And doctor asked questions like, so who am I talking to? Who is this person? Uh, give these uh, feelings a name, something like that. And then of course, she was a patient, they're a doctor, a patient talking to a doctor is supposed to comply to whatever doctor say and then you add names and then you started to think that you really have DID. And then doctors started looking for trauma and then they found it and then she was officially diagnosed. But what's interesting of her case was this, she was on medication and in and out mental hospitals for a few years and when she started to pick herself up, quitting medicine and starting exercising, she got better and one day she suddenly realized, wait a second, I didn't have the idea at all. All I had was depression, I was feeling unhappy, and now I came out from it, what have I done? And there were also a lot of reports about psychiatrists misdiagnosed depression patients as DID patients as well. It certainly feels like the doctors and psychiatrists, some of them were just following what they were taught, following certain SOP and diagnose depression patients as DID patients. But the thing is, our mind is such an ambiguous thing. Sometimes you can't really tell and judge based on some criteria written on the paper. You can do that with your body. You can measure your blood pressure, you know, your temperature and so on. So I guess what I'm saying is diagnosing a person's personality disorder has chance to be inaccurate. And speaking of false memory, it plays a big part in this diagnosis. Because what we always think is that we could forget something. But what most people didn't know is that while you can forget something, you can also mistakenly remember something too. So again, this could be where it goes wrong as well. So I mentioned about multiple personality later was changed to dissociative identity disorder, DID. It happened in around 1990s. Why? Now you see, they started to realize that the impact of the name itself gives a huge misconception for people. It says multiple personalities, which means there are more than one human being living in your body. And because you were convinced about that, you started to look for evidence and you will always find what you seek for. Dissociative identity disorder clears up the misconception where one person has a few personalities. Yes, the patient could split, but not into two or like 20 personalities, but into fragments of one personality. So what that means is DID patient doesn't have more than one personality. They have less than one personality. No, it doesn't sound so scary and dramatic, right? It sounds like we all have it. Like sometimes we're angry, sometimes we're happy, and sometimes we're sad. Those are fragments of our personalities. And I noticed there are common things about DID patients. Number one, most of them were very intelligent people. We're not talking about just smart, we're talking about very intelligent. Number two, they all somewhat have great sense of art. Billy Milligan was very good in painting. Sybil was also very good in painting. And there were some other DID patients who were good in sculpturing. So it looks like they don't run very far from having good imagination and creativity. 
and think about what imagination and creativity could do to a DID patient. Number three, some of them, not all, some of them had imaginary playmates. Billy Milligan had it when he was about two to three years old. He started seeing hallucination that there was just the other boy sitting across of the wall and he was like starting to wave the boy and stuff like that. Sybil also had imaginary friends when she was young. For their cases, it didn't sound like it was very hard for them to make up the idea of having few persons in their body. So I don't know what do these traits have to do with DID, but there are definitely some common things that we could notice. Another interesting thing I want to talk about in this video is EEG test. You'll be thinking if we want to know if the person is really faking it, you know, imagining all these things happening, or do they really have different personalities living in the body, why don't you take them to an EEG test? So for those of you who don't know what EEG test is, it's basically a technology used to evaluate the electric activity that happens in your brain. What it gives you is the brain wave. So there was this case where a woman with 15 different personalities was brought to be tested with EEG. The result was that the actual brain wave itself didn't show much dramatic difference. However, the muscle tension and the heart rate changed. What that means is that her physical state changed. And based on that, they later concluded that it was not acted out or it was not imagined. Um, I totally get, I totally get it. But I'm, I'm just thinking like, can you not act in different physical state? Isn't that how most of the actors do it? And then at the same time, an interesting fact was that the author of Billy Milligan's book actually kept the actual EEG test results of Billy Milligan himself. He was tested a few times and the results show completely different brainwave. And then there were some skeptics. So researchers later did a study. They brought two groups of people. First group of people were really DID patients. Second group of people were just volunteers and they asked them to imagine and pretend that they have DID. First group of patients went in different brainwave. The second group of subjects who were supposed to pretend went in, did all they can to pretend that they have DID. And it turned out that there wasn't much difference in their results. I guess it's a very ambiguous study. I don't know who's right, who's wrong. So I guess the conclusion of this video I want to make is this. It's very hard to define whether it's real or fake. What if it's fake? Sure. What if it's real? What harm could it do to the patient? The saddest thing about mental health patients is that people don't believe they have mental health. That's their biggest pain. Remember the, the movie, the Joker's quote? I forgot what's the quote, let me look it up. Joker said, the worst part about having a mental illness is people expect you to behave as if you don't. So whether it's really real or not in their world, it's real. What else is real? Them needing your attention and care is real. Whether the disorder is real or not. Yes, they could be asking for attention and you could be thinking about that all day, but think about the consequences that could happen if you just ignore that. Them feeling the emotions is real. Whether they are using it as a manipulation mechanism or it really is their so-called problem. Think about it, if it's real and they are being denied, that could set them on a suicidal path. If it's really fake and they are being denied, there's a good chance that they will be in a position where they try so hard to prove to people and that could set them to a suicidal path as well, just to prove to people that they have problems. So I guess what I really want to say at the end of this video is that if you're one of those people who are diagnosed with DID or suspect that you have DID and you're watching this video right now, know that people are not in your head and they need time to think about and understand whatever that's happening with you. So give them that time. And if you're watching this video and you have someone in your life who are struggling, suspend your judgment and be there for them. So what do you think about Sybil and the famous multiple personality disorder cases? Do you think they are real? Do you think they are fake? Let me know down in the comment section. I'll see you in the next video.